My name is Josh O'Connor, and I am the uh, producer and one of the hosts, along with these two other guys, of Modifius Calling Podcast. Yeah, hello. My name is Mitchell. Uh, I am a Twitch streamer uh, on Twitch of Penny for a Tale. I'm Scott. I'm a GM. I have GM's the uh, official Conan actual play for Modifius. You can find that over at Modifius' channel. And uh, for my day job, I'm a researcher in a social psychology lab. So I'm also interested in psychology and the psychology of games. We've got a lot coming up for you. Uh, we're going to be doing some, uh, some GM shiz, which is one of our segments. So uh, let's get to that. So I have a bit of a contentious opinion here. And that is that the no prep GM is the best GM. So hear me out, guys. Prep is prep, prepping a game, so preparing the adventure, looking up what the story is going to be, lining up all the NPCs, having all the monsters ready, all the treasures ready. That's good if you don't know how to run a game before. If you've never run a game and you need to know, uh, how does this game work? What do I even do in this game? What does it even look like to run a game for this? Prep is perfectly fine. You need to do that to sort of run you through it. It's a structure that you need to follow. But once you've done that a few times and you sort of get the, the lingo and you get the feel for it, you sort of get an intuition for these things and you can make up things on the spot to better fit the situation. And uh, my hypothesis here is that GM should be moving towards the no prep thing and abandon prep as a sort of, a sort of training wheels thing that they, need, that they need and might sometimes occasionally use to get them structure. But once you're really good and really confident with it, you should move on to uh, improvising as much of the session as possible. And this has a couple of benefits. One thing is it makes you extremely adaptable. If you have, I mean, a traditional D&D group could have some, something like this. The GM says, all right, we're going to play the Tomb of Horrors. This is the Tomb of Horrors. And then everybody shows up and, you know, they're all monks. So they're all wizards. And you say, well, this isn't really going to work. What do I do with my prep? Um, is, is the adventure going to go badly? I don't know. But if you had, if you were an improvising GM, you could say, okay, all wizard party. I got a great adventure for just wizards. You guys are going to have a big wizard duel with a bunch of other evil wizards or something. Just the idea that you can tailor the game to the players, not just who the players are, but then what they do within the story. You can, you can sort of like take hints from them and say, oh, your character is really interested about their, their father who was killed. Well, here's a great hint about that. Now let's do a side adventure tracking down the killer. Maybe the killer is the main villain of this piece. That's something that you kind of have to shoehorn in if you prep a game. And it sort of oftentimes goes against your prep and conflicts it. But if you don't have any prep, you can make that the centerpiece extremely easily. It frees up this space. There, there's a saying in improv, which is don't come into a scene with an entire cathedral built, come in with a single brick. Maybe that brick can be your prep. Maybe you have some ideas for uh, a certain type of villain, a certain type of conflict, maybe some stuff going on in the world. But don't plan beyond that. Don't plan any more than you need to. And uh, the less is better, because the less you have, the more you can take what the other players give you and build from that. What do you guys think? Mitchell, what do you think? I mean, so uh, I'm, I'm a person who uh, flies by the seat of my pants whenever I run a game. Uh, and generally, I do pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at improvisation and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, something I learned from improv... Baby. There is a baby uh, on this podcast. Everybody there is a baby. There is I promise you there's a baby somewhere around <laughs> <It's off camera. laughs> um but but something uh i learned from improv is that practice is a, a great thing and even on like voice acting podcasts and stuff like that um knowing uh and practicing uh what you want to bring to the table uh will help you produce a better game uh so right now i'm running invisible sun uh, whose plot lines and stuff are fully reliant upon what the players do. So I don't really plan for much uh, because I know they're just going to take it anywhere they want. Uh, but what I do try to do uh, is think of some NPCs they might run into. Think of the voices they might have. So that is not something I'm coming up on the fly. And if I try to come up on the fly, I'm less prepared and less able to provide a unique voice and a unique, unique experience for that character. Um, I like making well thought out NPCs uh, sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I think some prep is good. 
That's, that's interesting that you say that. I, I tend to do those sorts of things and I agree that like prepping voices, prepping characters, things like that. But it's interesting that when you look at a traditional RPGs adventure book, they don't say, oh, do this voice or they don't, they don't say those sorts of things. They're saying, this is the adventure. You go here and this person says this. <laughs> what do you think about that? Does, does your advice say to throw away that stuff? Oh, the, the throw away the... Uh... written adventure book, you know, the this is the adventure, this is the Tomb of Horrors or whatever. Oh man, those are always guidelines. <laughs> Unless you're you're uh, playing the Genesis, then uh, um, for me it's so well written the description and such that I, I have to I have to read it out loud. Um, but if I'm playing like a Wizard of the Coast or Piezo a uh, adventure path, I'm like I read it, I paraphrase it, and throw stuff of my own. I can my my approach to prep is a little different because I tend to run a lot of investigative games, primarily Call of Cthulhu. And stuff like that. And even if I do like a medieval game, it's probably going to be revolved something around like it's going to start off with a murder mystery, basically. Um, I also run a lot of pre written adventures because I personally find that coming up with my own mystery is hard. And if somebody is like specializes in writing mysteries, like I want to take advantage of all their knowledge because together my mind and their mind can come up with a superior experience. So because of that, I generally have to do prep. But I might not do as much prep as the writer kind of thinks I am. I mean, what I will do is, even when it comes to rule books, I probably will only read, you got to read the character generation section. You have to read like the one part of the combat system and the skill system that explains how to adjudicate a task, resolve a task. And then if there's magic and stuff like that, I often tell the players, if you want to have a magic character, like you need to figure out the magic system <laughs> and run it during the game. Sometimes I even hand off running parts of the game to other players, like you track initiative, uh, look up the magic stuff in, you know, you, you, that player, look up the magic stuff and, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll take care of, you know, what the bad guys do or something like that. So I, you know, that's like kind of the basic prep. But when it comes to like prepping off of a source, cause I'm always using these pre-published adventures. <clears throat> I mean, if I have time, I'll read the whole thing. Um, I will at least skim the entire thing. And then usually before each adventure, I'll read as far as I think the players are going to get and maybe a little bit more because maybe they'll take a direction maybe they'll decide to go to the church first instead of going to the graveyard or whatever so i'll do a little kind of refresher right before the adventure but essentially during the adventure i don't write down npc stats i don't even print out that page that has the npc stats on it if i you know i might the only ones that i might use are like you know okay how good are they with their weapons because i know in Call of Cthulhu, the average uh, enemy has a 50% on their fighting skill. So I know I can do that. And if any other skill, I can just roll 2% of the dice, and that's their skill. And then did they roll under it? Okay, yes or no. Um, so, And the other thing I have instead of prep is I have a lot of different cards. I have um, Metal Weave Games um, character cards, which just are basically a bunch of the facets of a personality, each in a, its own deck, like traits or quirks or drives or relationships and when i need an npc i'll pull something off that i'll look at it i'll be like okay i got a sense for that guy he whistles all the time perfect uh his drive is he needs respect great uh, and then i have character cards that have just pictures of characters on them and maybe a name and i use that a lot so that the players can keep track of it um so essentially i i'm pretty much down with minimal prep on the core book and you know i just don't have enough time there's too much information coming at me in my head all the time from the work i do and when it comes to the adventure, I'll read uh, as much of it as I need to to run, but I'm not going to like read it three times. I'm not going to take notes. I probably won't print out a bunch of things. Sometimes I uh, take the adventure, cut it up, and put it in an order that I can deal with it better, but that's kind of my approach. I don't know what you uh, think of that. This is an interesting point. Uh, the idea of you can't really prep an investigation game because there has to be a mystery, right? I mean... Perhaps you could it's more prep than, a It's more that you have to prep an adventure, uh, a mystery game because there is a mystery. Right, right. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to be like improvising it and then you get to the end and it's like the finale of Lost. Or like, but what did it all mean? And you're like, oh, I don't know, I was making it up. That's you why can't... I didn't like Lost when I found out they were randomly pulling names out of hats. Uh, to decide who to focus yeah, on. so you want to at least have like an end goal thing ahead of time so you can like extrapolate what the clues would be and stuff like that. But do you think that because of this, improv or not improv investigation games where there's a mystery are they more at risk of going off the rails because you can't improv as much i mean i i i improv a lot in terms of mystery games um i've run very few mystery games that i was like oh this was a fun mystery 
and I've run a lot of mystery games where I've just kind of, I improv it all, uh, where I've really enjoyed it and people have as well. Um, so I, I've really, I mean, prep and no prep really depends on where your, where your strengths are in terms of a GM. Uh, you play to your strengths, you work on your weaknesses and in the end you try to make a great game. So do you disagree with Scott's point that all GMs should be on the journey to doing no prep? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I think, uh, every GM has their own journey. Uh, and you, you know, it, it's their personal journey. I'll tell uh, you the, in, the writer for, uh, sorry to cut you off, but the writer for RuneQuest, uh, the laundry Conan, uh, Jason Dural is a great author. Um, when he plays a game, he put on Facebook that the only prep that he has is he's got the dice and he's got a bunch of cards. He runs it all out of his head. And presumably, since he writes so many mysteries, he's doing mysteries. Yeah, yeah that's good for him. I mean, in the end, as GMs, you're, you're, you're trying to entertain the players. If they're entertained, it really doesn't matter how you get there. Interesting. Scott, I wonder if you talk more about how you prep uh, mysteries. I mean, or so how you don't prep mysteries, right? If you could just go in and sort of improv it. I mean, you... you you have to, you kind of have to work backwards, right? I'm uh, I'm guessing you're not. You don't just sort of plant clues and then connect them up later. Do you sort of like plan the, the solution first and then work backwards? What does that What does that improv look like? Um, I usually throw a question uh, or a mystery, a simple one, right? It's either a scene, it's something they don't know about, and then I wait to hear what the players say, uh, and then I take aspects of what their theories are and I weave it into a mystery. And as they continue to follow strands that they themselves have created, uh, so they're like, oh, this you know, this dead person, there's this little thing here, maybe we should investigate this area. And I'm like, I didn't think about that. But hey, you know, that's now a strand that you guys will follow, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna now make that part of the, the story. Uh, yeah, so I just listen to what the players are saying, and I, with them, without their knowledge, uh, make the mystery. So how do you make sure that the mystery is effective and has an effective conclusion and doesn't just whiff? Because everything that I make is a combination of what I uh, see as a GM and what they are thinking about. I get you, but I mean, how do you, how do you make it a mystery? I mean, how do you keep them from knowing what's going on and then reveal what's going on and then have what's going on? How do you keep them from not figuring it out, basically? Because uh, in the end, like what they what they uh, what they think is the answer, I might move it or I might change aspects of it uh, because the end goal, the end mystery isn't set in stone at the start of the adventure. Uh, it at the end could be whatever I want it to be. So the the solution, the conclusion, the climax uh, becomes something that the players have created um and then i kind of throw in some things to make it a little bit more spazzazz i mean yeah but i mean how do you prevent a whiff ending you, you never had a whiff ending i'm saying like the ending is just okay you go down into a hole in the ground and there's a monster there i mean no and- because that that's 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 bad improv uh at, at least in my opinion uh none of my games have ever ended like that um and i've never had a conclusion that was unsatisfactory so I'm going to bring up another point here. Um, as, is it important to have a real mystery? If the player characters go through the phases that you see on a police procedural, that is, they discover a shocking body, they search for clues, they talk to a bunch of people, they talk to a guy in a warehouse who's moving boxes and doesn't stop, ta- doesn't stop moving boxes even though he's talking to homicide detectives, which presumably is an unusual thing for him. Maybe he does it all the time because they always go to the same warehouse. Um, <laughs> As long as you have them going through the steps that they feel they should be going through an investigation and they're running those scenes, and then you give the reveal, like, I wonder, do you really have to have a mystery? Is it like a novel that somebody's going to read over 500 pages and be trying to figure out, and you need to make sure that you obfuscate things? Like, what I'm saying is, like, does does it need to be a real mystery, or do you just go through the scenes and then end it? I mean, so... When a GM tries to write a novel via a game, uh, I, I've I've always seen that as a bad thing. If you want to write a novel, write a novel. Uh, if you want to co-write something, you're a GM. It's no longer your IP. Uh, it's the table's IP. 
Um, so that's what I have to say about but that. But we're not really talking about somebody writing a novel. They're writing a mystery game, and and you know, and they're not saying you have to go through the mystery this way. At least not good one, good mystery <laughs> uh, scenarios. Don't try to railroad the players. But they do have like clues and things like that. And mm -hmm. and the 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 idea is uh, the players get closer and closer. They follow some red herrings. There's a lot of uh, there's still a lot of storyteller arc art that the uh, writer is putting into that scenario. Uh, they're not being a novelist and trying to like. Yeah, I guess. What's, what's the question here? Well, the question is, do you need to have... Uh, Graham Walmsley, for example, writes about how to do a mystery. Five mm -hmm. steps uh, with a kind of increasing horror. Um, and he makes it kind of... And, and he's, a, he's a great mystery uh, adventure scenario writer, you know? And I, we've run a couple of his games. We had a great time. So he says that there's definitely a structure, you know? And then you're slowly unveiling what the mystery is so that you can make sure you got that punch at the end. But I'm wondering whether you even need to worry about all that technique. Just have them do a bunch of investigative type things and then do the reveal. Like, will they notice? Um, Isn't that the same thing, though? I don't understand how those are different. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, like, don't worry about slowly unveiling the clues. Just kind of, like, unveil the clues. They start to figure it out. I mean, instead of trying so, to weave uh, a web... Yeah, I'm like talking about a light touch or a heavy touch by the GM, right? Is, do, you, do you run it as kind of a sandbox to say, like, well, here's all the things you can investigate. All right, they go here, they go here, they go here. And then it's like, all right, well, they're getting kind of close. Like, maybe I'll reveal enough for them to go here. Uh, and then the adventure will be over. Or do you kind of be like, okay, like, we need to, like, pace this out and, like, increase tension. Is that kind of what you're saying? I guess I'm saying, yeah, I guess because that's one approach. You slowly reveal the adventure as you go on, and then the other approach is just to, like, not worry about it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm a little bit distracted because Mr. Smith has been in the chat. Welcome. Yeah. It says depends on the players, which I think is important yeah. and is always the case. Everything depends on the players and the GM. Um, it would be interesting to see how that kind of uh, helps us to get where we're going. I think it might be similar to what Mitch was saying about taking your cues from the players and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's it's all about adapting to the players. Are they building towards something? Are, are they getting more excited about a certain strand? Are they talking about theories and everything? You ride that, that tornado wherever it takes you. Um, I think as a GM, you should always keep in mind kind of like the basis of storytelling, which is, you know, you, you want like that, you know, that, that curve, which is the basis of like all storytelling where there's, there's growth, there's character, things change from beginning to end, uh, the characters change. Um, you know, I think these basic principles of story players, uh, you know, you should always keep in mind, but you of know, of course. Yeah. But that goes without saying that we should keep the basic principles of storytelling that we should focus on the players, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm yeah. But to, that's I'm kind of, I guess the question I'm asking is, does it, does the mystery need to be mysterious? <laughs> I, I think, I think so. <laughs> Cause I'm saying, I'm arguing that maybe it doesn't because, <laughs> you let that you run them through the investigative scenes, you let them feel like detectives, and then you're like, and then you oftentimes I've, I've put out mysteries and things like that, and the players are kind of trying to figure it out, um, and they're not really getting any close to the mystery. And like, on you know, upon occasion, I've given them the clue that's going to take them to where they're going. That's what I mean. They didn't, as a group, figure it out and say, We need to go to the warehouse. I just give them an obvious clue that has like the victim's handwriting and a drop of blood, and it's yeah. on a card from the warehouse, so they know they have to go there. This is actually an interesting thing. I think it's really, in my experience, I feel like it's really hard to get players to figure stuff out on their own without just like giving them a, what you think is a crystal clear clue. That's what I'm. That's that's what I'm getting to. I think you have to. So therefore, have you guys seen a mystery? thing where you give people like a bunch of complicated puzzle pieces and they on their own assemble it out of what you think would be a very difficult thing? Like I haven't really seen that. I think the stuff that seems like a hard puzzle to us is like an impossible puzzle to them because we see it from our perspective because we know the answer and we're like, oh, these go together this way. And if they, they'll have just enough information to figure it out if you do this. But for them, like their minds are in a totally different place. Like yeah. they have totally different information and perspective. So like, it's just, they're not gonna see it the way you see it. So I think it's really exactly. hard to find that, that fine line where it's something that's like just hard enough. And I think maybe it's so hard that we shouldn't even try to do that. That's what that's what I was that's the answer to my question because a perfect example I'm running Resection of Time which is a con module for Call of Cthulhu it's at, it's set in the 90s it's absolutely fantastic it's so great plus it has like 27 handouts it has it's based on like in uh, Belize and there's like uh, that's where the story ends and they uh you know they have like uh drawings of Mayan artifacts they have like long uh 
research papers and things like that that the players can read. It's a blizzard of information to give the players, and my players loved it. They thought it was so cool. I had two people who had been anthropology students, and I was an anthropology major myself. So, like, everybody was, like, super into it. Um, but this, like, wealth of information, like, they, it was in there, but they couldn't find it. And, I, and it, anytime that happens, I think the players, like you say, Scott, they don't end up putting the dots together, and they don't end up going to the right place. In this place, in this case, there was one mention of Deep Ones and Innsmouth, so they took a side quest to Innsmouth that was totally not in the book at all. So I, while they were playing, I went out on Drive Through RPG. I downloaded, I bought and downloaded a book on Innsmouth, gave them the map, and then we ran like an entire session in Innsmouth that had nothing to do with the plot because that was just like kind of a red herring. It was just like a throwaway comment about that. The deep ones were not involved in the final mystery at all. And to actually get them to go to Belize, I mean, this was a multi-session adventure, way longer than the con game it was designed to be. And kind of eventually they exhausted all other options. So going to Belize, which they, which the adventure assumed they would do pretty quickly, became like the very last thing when they had no other opportunities. They were like, well, I guess we're going to Belize, guys, because we haven't figured it out anywhere else. And then once they're on the plane, you land them and then you give them another clue. And then it kind of basically you kind of railroad them there. I mean, I think Mr. Smith brings up a great point. Know your audience. I think that's the key to mystery. Some people have a, a different perspective on mystery and understanding where a person at is at in terms of their enjoyment of mystery and how they, uh, I guess, think about things is, is very important. I once tried to uh, force a puzzle, a puzzle dungeon on my uh, D&D players. Oh, puzzle dungeons are the worst. Sorry, go on. Yeah. I hate puzzles in, in video games too, but go on. Exactly. And I there were a couple people who loved the idea and there were a couple people who hated the idea. And that was an aspect of me not knowing my audience. Like if I am with a group of people who aren't that great at mysteries, then yeah, I'm going to have to, if they are still enjoying it, uh, kind of uh, shoe in some clues. If there are a bunch of people who love mysteries, like thinking about different theories and they start like talking about things and they're enjoying that, uh, you can kind of play it a little bit loose and kind of follow what, the strands that they they're talking about all right have you ever because scott is saying that no players are good at that and i've never run into any that could put even the simplest mystery together <laughs> without me putting up a great big signpost yeah that's <laughs> not I, the I think it's just like the nature of the the relationship between gm and players like i see lots of memes about this where people like i feel like what i who i feel like are new gms are like oh my players are idiots they don't get anything or like you know, there's like a meme where it's like, oh, like when you're a GM and somebody's Googling like puzzles for toddlers, you know, like, haha, funny joke. But like, you need to realize that perspectives from a players are so different. People like could take it any which way. And like one approach you could take is say like, oh, I think it's this. I think this is a great clue that'll lead us to it. And like, if you don't have a strong plot line that you're trying to follow, you could be like, all right, maybe that is the relevant clue. Maybe the mystery is over here right now. Maybe this other person is guilty. And you could kind of like, key it in and adapt it that way but you know if you're running like a, a big module with like a big bunch of set pieces across the world maybe that's less of a less of a good option i don't know yeah. i mean i did that in resection of time um and you know we i gotta say like going to Innsmouth was fun um mm -hmm. there was a mystery in there because i read another mystery and i made a mystery there and they had a fantastic time like running out like freaking ending up in a meeting hall full of deep one hybrids and having to get out and they, then they left all of their notes there in like the back because they didn't take their truck with them oh so no one of the characters had to go back in, in the middle of the night and like steal it um you know it, it is fine but i mean like in this in this adventure in this adventure like dude the missing scientist is in belize so if i can't make him i guess i could make him be an in insmith but then you know i don't know then you 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 then everything that's built up and all of the clues and things like that and all the references um and every, so much of the plot is in Belize. In fact, like the major plot element, which is that they actually were, they had been to Belize before, which they knew. But what they didn't know was that their brains had been operated upon after this horrific attack by monsters. And when they get to Belize, they remember it. And they freak out. They have to roll sanity. And then they're like, oh my God, like we were there like 10 years ago and we, it's totally been blocked out of our brains. And now it's all coming crashing in. I mean, like oh, that's cool. basically 80, like, 80% of, of, of the adventure was in Belize, so they got to go there, right? So you can't, I mean, you know, so I did. I did. I let them run with it. They went to Innsmouth. We did all this stuff. But eventually I did have to put a big old signpost or I, they ran out of other options and they ended up going there. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
I mean, I think the the big thing is is know your audience. <laughs> That's a truism. Yeah. yeah. That's a truism. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. Uh, we can't answer our debates with truisms. We should. Because uh, <laughs> otherwise, have another debate about like. I always say all right. that. Every time we do a podcast, it comes out to like, um, well, you know, know your group. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such an important thing that GMs oftentimes ignore. But we don't. They, yeah, but I feel at times we we do. I mean, it's something that everyone struggles with. Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, it's something you have to put a lot of effort into uh, and you, you have to do, have focus with the players and such like that. Um, and if you, if you know your players, you're able to adapt or you're able to kind of just be like, Oh, they're not a group that does uh, adaptations. Well, mm-hmm. um, it, I mean, GMing is all about, it's a response thing. And much like improv, you, you got to listen, you got to watch and you got to respond. Um, if your players aren't finding the clues and you got to, you got to change everything up. So that's still an enjoyable experience for them. I agree with you, but the, the answer to every debate we have on the show can't be know your players. I mean, it'll be kind of, I think eventually be, that becomes hollow advice. Do you know what I mean? It's like, good, make good choices. I mean, yeah, it's I'll, hard to teach, right? I mean, it is something that everybody has to work at. I think like, even if you do know your players, you also have to like know their expectations for things. Mm-hmm. Like, like for example, uh, I mean, I played with Josh. For a long time and and we had known each other pretty well as like gm players and uh when you ran dungeon call classics for us i had a misunderstanding about what the game was like uh i made a character who was kind of going to come in with like a big backstory and was going to like made for long-term campaign play but dcc is really like a sort of fun house dungeon like super crazy things happening that you, you're not supposed to make like very detailed characters with like very emotional backstories it's just supposed to be like um uh your character is supposed to be like a plate for crazy shit to happen on, right? And I didn't, in, I didn't enjoy it the first time I played it because I didn't get that. And that's something that um, I didn't really know enough to ask as a player or anything. And, and I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Josh? Well, I mean, D- Dungeon Crawl Classics, and, and this actually is good because this kind of actually gets us back to your original question, which was how much prep should you have? Dungeon Crawl <laughs> Classics is pretty much specifically designed to be low prep. Like, mm-hmm. the adventures are rarely longer than about 14 pages and heavily illustrated at that. So there's not a whole bunch of stuff in there. You can often get by with only briefly skimming the material or just reading the first bit. Um, And so much can change in the adventure. In that particular adventure we ran, um, one of the players turned himself, he rolled really weird on the magic table and he could choose an effect and he chose to turn himself into a spider. Um, Like a spider man, like spider eyes and like hair and... Right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that guy ain't going to be able to travel on him <laughs> now. And yeah, like, my, my character was like, wait, yeah, James's character was like six feet tall, but like all his joints were fragile, and my character became pregnant even though he's a man. Two characters like, became pregnant, and two people ended up being yeah. 12 feet tall because you guys kept drinking the uh, the potions. Yeah, the potions, <laughs> oh, it's just like... Trying to figure out the puzzle because it was a puzzle. Yeah. It was a series of puzzles. It was the, uh, the Court of Chaos was the adventure, and like the puzzles were kind of hard. And mm-hmm. which is okay. It doesn't call classic. Doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Everybody's a winner because everybody loses. But I mean, <laughs> like that was a tough puzzle. But I mean, like you pl- preparing your character like that, yeah. And if I had tried to prep a campaign and I ran that adventure, Dungeon Call Classics is lethal to that. It's fatal to that. I mean, for example, I actually was kind of trying to do that. I was trying. It was before Conan came out, and I wanted to run uh, Dungeon Call Classics in the Conan universe. So you guys came up with players kind of with that expectation. And I was like, okay, and I'm gonna first I'm gonna run uh, Intrigue of the Court of Chaos, and then I'm gonna run the Black Mask, and I'm gonna run this other one. And even I didn't read the second two, but even that much prep was too much prep. Because <laughs> we got through the first adventure and you guys were permanently <laughs> made into inhuman monstrosities. <laughs> and we pretty much needed to leave you there unless you're gonna find a wizard who can like, I can turn you all back, you know. Mm-hmm. So there was absolutely no. If you're playing Dungeon Call Classics, I think we can say there's absolutely no point in prepping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like the magic mishaps table is crazy. Like I remember there's one where it's like if you're a wizard rolling a spell and it's, I think it's if you roll really well or like if you fumble or something. There's this huge table you roll on. And one of them is like you create a 300 foot column of fire that goes out like for like like 10 miles and just burns everything that it touches. Like 
you can forget a campaign if that can happen, right? Exactly. There was You're just talking no as way. a king, and then that happens, and it's like, well, <laughs> half the kingdom's burned down. Yeah, there's no way to establish. Um, there's no way to prep for Dungeon Crawl Classics, and like this is an interesting issue that I'm I'm hoping to explore um, with the new with the Kickstarter that they put out for Lankmar, which is a uh, kind of a 50 year old, 70 year old, I don't know, 50 1950s setting by Fritz Leiber, and um, you know they they. In the Kickstarter, they wrote like I think twelve adventures for it or something like that, and I'm like, with my experience with Intrigue of the Court of Chaos, how the heck are, am I going to take a group through that? And there are a couple ways that they get around that. One is they're like, all right, do it the way Pulp Fiction always did it, which is that the stories are not sequentially linked. It's not like a it's not like the Sopranos or a modern TV show where there's a season long arc or something like that or multi season arc. It's like each story will happen at a kind of different phase in the players' lives and stuff like that. So you certainly don't have to worry about injuries and things like that, temporary effects, even like weird enchantments. You know, you can say, oh, you went to a wizard, you sorted it out. But I mean, um, so because I was like, how can you possibly chain these things together? And that's one of the ways that they say to do that is don't. But they also have had, to, they say that they've had to adjust the way that they write games in order to make it possible to run a campaign in that. I still don't know whether or not it's going to be possible to prep. Yeah. Scott, how are we doing with the topic? I think we've covered a lot of ground here. We've um, beaten everything. Yeah, we, we talked about the sort of balance <laughs> of prep of sometimes, I feel like even if you prep heavy, you're going to need to do a little bit of improv. And even if you want to come in with no prep, it's still good to have some kind of ideas of even just characters or scenes or something. Uh, oh, uh, one thing that I want to talk about and let's get into briefly is... Um, Dungeon World has this cool thing that the community has made where rather than making big adventure modules, it just has one page dungeons. And they're these, like the simplest things where it'll have like maybe a picture, maybe not, but then it'll just be like, uh, here's a location, like here are some feelings, like uh, an empty sky with like a, a distant shadow looming in the darkness or like uh, a chain that stretches from the earth all the way to the sky. And then it'll have like some magic items and like that's it. And it's just like a, it's like a palette for you to make up an adventure from. It's not restrictive in any way. It's not a series of events. It's just, here's a bunch of ideas. You can use some of them, none of them. Add in your own stuff, whatever. It's just like, just enough you need to get you boosted into improv in your own game. And um, I think, yeah. um, I, I, I really like that. And there is a, I think there is kind of a movement for one page adventures. Um, Savage Worlds does tons of them. And many of them hmm. are freely downloadable. Uh, it's kind of the typical adventure format. Like in Savage Worlds, you tend to buy a setting book. You buy the core book, then you buy a setting book, which kind of changes the rules and adapts them to that setting. Um, but as far as the adventures go, they're often free and downloadable. You know, just download one or something like that, or ten. And they're all like that. They're all just like kind of like an outline. This is the bad guy. This is what you're going on. There's a great book called Eureka, put out by the people who do EN World, I believe. And it's just like, I think 500 of those, 500 like quarter page sketches. Uh, of adventures there's a but again with savage worlds the, the path of cain for solomon cain uh they have like a 240 page book that's just like one page adventures like hmm. like, like seriously like over 100 of them so i think that can be one way of doing it. another pelgrane also has had one page adventure contests and some of them are really freaking good so you know i think that that's probably a kind of uh saying like yeah we, you know we as writers understand that you know lower prep is something that uh, you know you should move towards. Now, yeah. Mitchell, what about uh, I want you to bring Paizo Adventure Paths for Pathfinder into this Rise of the Rune Lords? <laughs> to, you know, ten books or whatever. You get them over ten months. You know, so the ultimate enemy of GM improv or low <laughs> or low prep for sure because you got to read the books. What do you think? Mental. The the Piazzo. Um, so I've I've ran War of the Crown and Wrath of the Righteous, um, and then I'm about to start playing Hell's Rebels uh, Sunday. Um, <clears throat> reading through them, especially War of the Crowns, was a, a pretty uh, unique adventure because uh, it's a very social intrigue based adventure, um, and they have a, a few kind of dungeon crawls in there, but like the second book is really open and, uh, uh, free and stuff like that. Um, actually, uh, let's see if I can grab it. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, uh, I believe the second one. Scott, look um, how thick that is. Mitchell, show him how thick it is. 
Oh, that's that's not that bad. Yeah, it's uh, it's but about a hundred pages. There's like a bunch of them, right? Oh, oh, this is out of ten. Yeah, this is. Well, I think they're usually out of about six. Yeah. I think War of the Crown goes to six. This is one one book that takes you, I think, through three levels. Um, How many sessions do you think that is in there? Uh, so the average, because I I ran this when I was a professional GM. The average um, group got through a book in about five sessions. All right. Um, it is a long campaign. Oh yeah, yeah. Thirty <laughs> session campaign. Yeah. Um, War of the Crown's a great uh, AP, uh, in in my opinion, um, especially since it has these like strict um, uh, dungeon crawls, which people can kind of uh, relax in, just enjoy some some good old dungeon crawling. Uh, but it also has these open fields where you, as a GM, improv. Uh, and they give ideas about certain things and there's adventures and everything, but I did a lot of improvisation and, and threw in my own stuff and took away stuff and uh, kind of made it unique for, for each group. And especially the way that they approached it and what they did first drastically changed kind of like the narrative of the, of, of a books AP or, uh, the narrative of a game, um, so, you know, in terms of the, uh, the AP, I would always read it at least twice I like to be as prepared as possible for uh, an adventure path because I like running adventure paths um, as strict to the spirit of it as, as, as possible because as a GM, I really want to, to get, get the sense of what the author was trying to communicate to the players. Um, but I, I always add my own flares. There's funny voices to be added. There's different things, and you just kind of follow the players and what they want to do. Uh, and they always make a, a great story. That's interesting that you take it and sort of make it your own and can add or take away things. I mean, the first thing I do when I make an adventure is I, I pretty much never run it out of the book because I, I hate this phenomena of like, you know, the players ask you something and you're like, oh, uh, flip through the book. Uh, <laughs> wait, hang on. Like, I, I want to avoid that as much as possible. So yeah. I usually just make like a doc and just put all the stuff in it. So it's in a way that like I know where everything is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like we, we did the practice of all with Conan and like one of the first things I did was I rewrote the first scene. There's like a part in the beginning where you guys are on a ship and there's like a storm and I just took it out. And I was like, no, I want to start on the beach. That's more interesting to me. Oh, and yeah. so when you do things like that, what I'd be afraid of is like, I, I get the first book and I'm like, okay, like, let me just change a few things here. And the next book will be like, oh, remember in the first book when this happened and you'd be like, oh no, I took that out or, oh, I changed it. Now this adventure doesn't work. So is <laughs> yeah. that a danger? And what was your experience dealing with that? So it was definitely something I feared because they would make a note about, hey, introduce this P NPC. Um, here are a few like uh, playing notes, but this will be more important later on. Um, but for the most part, they gave me more information about the, PC the NPCs that will be relevant in this adventure. And so in general, the players just kind of gravitated towards these people. Um, there was a couple of, ki couple of times I... Ugh, a couple of times where I had to uh, be a little meta because, uh, you know, in a social environment, there's all these people to talk to and everything. Uh, and I, I was like, these are the, uh, you know, after a while when they're like, I want to talk to this person, this person, this person. I'm like, these are the people who are kind of important to the story. Because uh, I, as a GM, want to make sure that uh, the players um they they are enjoying in a way that they're not wasting their time. So the players I had really wanted to to experience the, the story and wanted to make sure that who they were talking to was relevant to the story and not like a uh, an NPC in MMO game. Um, so that's kind of the, the the danger about that sort of thing because if I was running it myself, uh, I would make you know this NPC that they really attached to become a a thing. Uh, but obviously I can't do that within an AP as well because there is a overlying story that is taking place. Um, and by signing on to an AP, the, the players in them themselves have agreed to kind of follow this arc. Um, so, you know, there, there's room to improv, but that's why I read it again and again, because I want to know the themes uh, and, and what the author is trying to say within the AP. The more I know of the world, the more I'm able to improv within it. Cool. So that getting back to, to our question about prep, that's like you prep intensely when you run that. It reminds me when I ran um, Horror on the Orient Express, 
for Call of Cthulhu. And, you know, there's a camp. Before you even get into the adventure, you have to read the campaign book. Mm -hmm. Which is a couple, you know, 128 pages, maybe more. Um, and then, you know, you really have to read each chapter. And what I would do to make the players not feel like they were being railroaded in a campaign that is literally set on a train, on a railroad, on tracks, <laughs> going in one direction, um, is I just let them spend as much time as they wanted, like, doing stuff. And I always allow the players a chance to socialize. So, for example, they're only really supposed to do this one short thing in London, but they ended up spending probably several days in London over several sessions before they ever even got on the train to go, uh, you know, to Istanbul or whatever. Uh, and I kept, you know, everywhere they went, I would just, what I would do is throw up some random characters or just, uh, if they met an NPC, I might choose the play, choose my own place where they're going to meet that NPC. Like, oh, you know, he's a, you go to the, mental institution and there's an orderly who wants to talk to you so he takes you to like a little french tavern and then they spend an entire session in the tavern like talking to whoever's there and stuff like that um but again i mean that was a pretty intensive prep for that game i don't see how i could have run it without doing all that prep yeah i mean adventure paths um you know someone someone spent a lot of time writing this you kind of want to respect the people who who did it um you know, that's why I like to, to, to read them and, and go over them, because uh, I feel like the more you're able to understand what the author is trying to get at in the adventure, the better you're able to communicate it in your own way to the players. But didn't you say earlier that you don't like to run pre that, that that's why you don't like to run uh, pre written adventures? You said earlier you don't like to run them. Yeah, I mean, I immensely love doing my own stuff more than running pre generated uh, games or APs. Um, but, you know, uh, there's things that I learned from uh, adventure paths that uh, if I stayed away from them, uh, I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and the more I kind of look at different uh, uh, modules and stuff like that, uh, the more I grow as a GM. So I'm less resistant to it now than I was in the past. Um, but, you know, it's a journey, man. What do you think, Scott? <laughs> This whole adventure yeah. path aspect. I mean, we can call them campaigns, I mean, too, because in other games, they're just called campaigns. I mean, I kind of want to go with my, my contentious thing in the beginning is that, like, why would you run an adventure path when you can write your own? I mean, it's, it's so much more rewarding to do your own type of stuff. Now, it's like, if you have an adventure path that you really like and you're like, well, I'm really excited for the ideas in this, like, sure, but I, I feel like they can be so restrictive and... It's, it's it's really good if you just want to run a game starting off and you like can't populate that space. But like, I don't know. I, I read some clickbaity article one time that I kind of liked the message of it, and it was like top. What was it? It's like top most memorable or best creatures in D and D. And you know, it's like beholders, blink dra uh, blink dogs, blink dogs, uh, displacer beasts. And then like dragon was number two, and I was like, what's number one going to be? You covered everything else, and number one was your own custom monster. That's because the stuff you create, you're going to enjoy the most, even if it's like imperfect, even if it's bad. It's special to you and your group. So like, maybe there's there's people out there who run adventure modules and could improv, could make up their own stories, even if it's prepping it in the same way. Which maybe it's good for a game like Pathfinder. Um, you know, like make the leap and and make your own stuff because even if it's it's janky and imperfect, it's going to feel so much better and it's going to be like a good expression of you and. Uh, that's what tabletop gaming is all about. Yeah. I mean, uh, the best uh, campaigns and modules I enjoy is when they say at the beginning, like, you know, this is in the end your story. So we've given you a, a framework, uh, but, you know, this is your playground. They're your players. Um, have fun with it. I'd like to read Mr. Smith's comment in the chat uh, that one of the best GMs that he ever had uh, – Primarily, he had a primary story arc, e.g. the event will happen by the end of each arc, but every episode in between was solely determined by the players and driven by them with just enough prep to have a goal for that session. And I think that sounds like a kind of a happy medium. Yeah, that kind of sounds like the thing you were describing, Josh, where like with the, the railroad where you say, okay, we got to get on the railroad and go to these stops, but... When you get yeah. off, you can do whatever you want here, and maybe you have little goals there, little things they can achieve to help them along their way. Sure, I mean, that's I why that's... I run. Let's. I tend to run just individual adventures, and then use that technique to kind of build them out. There was one that you guys played in where there was really one overarching adventure. There was a side 
there, were, there was like one 20 page adventure that you were playing as the main quest. And then I had another one that also had crows in it that I read. So I was like, okay, I'll throw that one in too as a side quest. And then there was just tons of player driven stuff. Like one of the players having to break into Herod's to buy a, to steal a suit because he couldn't afford one. And he was tired of dealing with the classism of 1920s Britain um, and stuff like that. Like the fact that some of the players became addicted to ether and the problems this caused. Uh, the fact that one of the players uh, wanted to go to a creepy bookstore, arcane bookstore, and like that led to its own sidetrack. And then um, another guy was just having dinner in a Chinese restaurant and somebody was uh, harassing the owner and he got he intervened. And all of a sudden they're dealing with triads, you know. Um, so that way, so I mean, that was actually very little prep. I had to read two adventures, uh, and yet I got like ten sessions out of that. So I mean, like pretty much a campaign. Mm -hmm. So in terms of prep, it was low, but it delivered uh, a lot, particularly for the prep that was involved. Yeah, and it also like uh, depends on the setting that you're in, because um, like you know, if you're uh... Uh, I mean, what what Mr. Smith is talking about in his last question, pre-gen world versus custom world, right? Yeah. Part of the experience of running a piezo AP is that you're in a world already. And when the players come to it, they expect uh, co some consistencies from the uh, Pathfinder world. Um, that, I think, requires more prep because you are you're you have to learn the world that the players are learning too. Um Compared to like, you know, if you're running a, a 1920 Call of Cthulhu where the world, everyone generally has the same uh, view of what the 1920s was uh, here in America. Um, or if you're making your own custom world where you can kind of make things up on the fly or change things based on how it goes. Yeah, I mean, in running a game like RuneQuest, the world is so tied to the mechanics and it's so vast and deep and you really want to play in that world because it's so new and interesting. Mm -hmm. And... Like when you make characters in it, you start with, all right, here's your grandmother. Let's go through her life and see all the events that she saw. Oh, this king rode into these people and there was this. And then this winter thing happened. And then this army came over and overthrew these people. Now let's go to your parents. Like that's stuff that uh, as running it, I was kind of afraid to improv too much in terms of the big history stuff because it might conflict or it might, it might just make things really complicated. Um, yeah. So it's good to, you know, I'll, I'll, I will wear my, my contentious improv everything hat, but I'll take it off if, if I say we're going to yeah. do it in a very detail rich uh, pre existing world because you need yeah. to like put some bounds on it so you don't run up against that stuff and make something that's impossible or conflicts with the tone or something in a way that maybe you weren't familiar with. Uh, but that said, that game was heavily improv because I, lim I limited it to a certain place and certain stakes. Is like, yeah, okay, there's this huge war going on that has generations of history and conflict between all these different ethnic groups and all this kind of magic and stuff. But you know what? This is what matters to this town and these people right now. And by binding it in this place and saying, this adventure is about this, it, it opened it up for improv. Maybe that's that stuff, all that big world stuff can be in the background, but it doesn't really matter for this. So I can make up whatever I want for just this one little slice of the world. Yeah, yeah you exactly. Can, you can zoom your lens in. Yeah, yeah, it's not like the every player like uh, read the book over and over again until we mastered the setting. Not uh, true. We were, well, see, in this case of RuneQuest, like Mitchell read the core book twice before he made a character. <laughs> I did Let actually alone. several times, but that's that's me. I I love getting into a game, and there that's won't be a. I, I love reading games too, so that's that's my own personal problem. Don't judge me. I always imagine when I buy a book, <laughs> I imagine myself sitting beside the fire, which I I need to buy a new starter for because it doesn't even work, and like you know with a cup of tea and a pipe and like kind of like paging through it. I never actually end up doing that. Um, yeah. And I hate reading on. PDFs oh. on readers. Oh my God. But oh yeah, Scott, I want to point out something Scott said, which is that in the RuneQuest game, the other thing that mean, meant he had to prep is that we were, we were not all newbies, right? Like two of the players, or one of the players at least, knew an awful lot about RuneQuest. And of course, Mitch knew about it because he read the book twice. And I think uh, our, the other player, Jesse, probably read a lot of it and, and knows a lot about the lore there too. So if the players are expecting a lot of specific lore, like I think it means you have to prep. Although as soon as you can, well, you need to do it for character generation anyway obviously for RuneQuest and but then of course like Scott said you can zoom in when it comes to telling your, your individual story yeah don't start off in a big cosmopolitan thing with lots of different players like not early on for a big thing like this if you're not comfortable with the world and setting and if your players are not equal in their knowledge of it because even if the GM is totally knowledgeable and can handle everything if you're if you know some of your players are super experts and some of them are new the new ones are gonna or the expert ones are gonna kind of 
steamroller things, and the new ones might feel intimidated or might not know what to do. This is a big problem in games like Eclipse Phase, which is like this huge and deep, really interesting transhumanist far future world where everybody's fully integrated with machines and death has been eradicated. People can just like download themselves into a new body and like, you know, port themselves over to Mars and things like this. It's so interesting and deep, but it's really hard to get into because it's so different because the world, like as a new player, you're just like, I don't even know what I can do. Like, what is this person even like? Um, so like what we said, like zooming it in, taking it slow, giving people understandable stakes, and then just building it out from there is, how, I think, a good approach. And how does that relate to, to the prep, I guess? So again, that's a game that you, you do need to prep because of the setting. And it's a little more than the setting, right? It's not just that Eclipse Phase happens to be set in the far future. It wouldn't make sense to run Bronze Age Eclipse Phase uh, because the, the game system is integrated with the world so much. So you need to understand what the game is pitching, right? Like. If you're playing a Star Wars game and you've never seen Star Wars, you don't know what it is. Well, you gotta at least go watch that, right? Prep at least yeah. that much so you know the tone and like the, you know, the gist of it. Like, don't don't be like, oh, I've never seen any science fiction at all. Let's run a science fiction. That's the one where you fight with swords, right? You know, like, yeah. Well, that's kind of honestly, Star Wars. Star Wars. You bring up Star Wars. I ran a Star Wars game. Scott was in it. Um, that was the, one of the least prepped games I've ever run. All I did was. I got my handle around, you know, my head around the rules, and we made characters. And I did this thing we do called microscoping that our group does a lot. At the beginning of the uh, first adventure, I said, "What do you guys want out of this adventure? What do you want to see in it? What do you want to see in the world?" And they said, "Somebody said speeder bike races. Somebody else said something else." So I was like, "Okay." So that gave me an idea for the first adventure. I'm like, "All right, you guys are in a speeder bike race, uh, and everybody's being bet on by different huts, and they're gonna everybody's gonna be mad if they lose." So, Did you do pod racing for your first session? Yeah, it was speeder bike racing. Well, oh, it's still it was, pod racing. I imagined it as pod racing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, somebody, and of course, somebody got to say the line. Now that's pod. Now this is pod racing. And so, they immediately exploded. Yeah, I mean, and it went incredibly well. Um, and then for the second adventure, it's like okay, and, and, and oh, and then the end of the adventure, they ran into uh, the guy whose name I can never remember. He's a doctor, apparently. He's the guy in the cantina scene in Star Wars. It goes. Oh, we're yeah. wanted oh, yeah. men i've got the death penalty on 12 systems so when they ran into him he was like watch where you're going and they were like blah blah, blah. and they said something and then he said we're wanted men i've got the death penalty on nine <laughs> systems which made everybody freak out they're like 12 12 i'm like nope this is early in the stage this is before the <laughs> way before star wars he's only got nine death penalties so then somebody was and i think they killed him so yeah. they had a fight. They oh, killed wait, him. We tried to make a deal with him or something, right? Wasn't he going to be tried. our friend and then we betrayed him? He died, yeah. He died anyway. And then you guys were like, okay, well, what we want to do is we want to go collect those nine bounties and get all that money. So I'm oh, like, yeah. perfect. I have a campaign. I have, I, at this point, I also was doing some augmented reality stuff. I had a projector that was projecting a map of the Star Wars universe on the wall of the game room. So they had the entire uh, galaxy there. And, you know, with a, with a little light pointer or whatever, we could point around. And I said... Guys, pick where you want to go, you know? Like I said, I, first I was like, what are the nine systems? And the players said what the nine systems were. And then uh, we just started going to them. And the only prep I did was I had bought a few Star Wars books for like a dollar each on Amazon. One of them was like the Star Wars Atlas. So when they said they wanted to go to Kessel, I read the entry for Kessel. And it's like, it's a mining colony and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, if it's a mining colony, that means it's probably run by the Empire at this stage. So I'm like, there's stormtroopers there and stuff like that. And then I was like, okay, there'll be a shady kind of Imperial captain who wants to make money. And then there'll be like his kind of like sergeant who's kind of, of stormtroopers who's kind of involved in organized crime. And then there'll be like some rebels there who are trying to have an uprising. And we had a fantastic session, which of course ended up in the whole place going up in flames because it's Star Wars. And that was yeah. an example of no prep. So we got well, that example out. I disagree. I think your prep was watching the movies. True. Yeah, that's what I would say, too. Yeah, Because sure, if, if I went movies. in, if as a GM, you were like, you know what? Tantooine, it has Ewoks and and uh, uh, no, Sith living yeah, together. Exactly. Yeah, People are going to be like, no, it doesn't. And I don't care. <laughs> oh, you, I you, might, you might think you're God, but that is not the case. Okay, I'm not going <laughs> to count that as specific out. prep because pretty much everybody's seen Star Wars. So many people have. It's well, weird when I, somebody I think, hasn't. Yeah, but that's an aspect of prep that goes on to learning a, a setting. If sure. you're going to a game that no one has saw the movie of in terms of setting, you, people are going to need to do some prep to understand the setting. 
That's good. Yeah, I'd like to do that as another podcast topic of running a game in a specific, like running a Doctor Who game. If one of the players has never seen Doctor Who, is like, should you do that? How should you do that? Oh yeah. Like I, like I ran. Talk about that later though. But yeah, I ran a Star Trek uh, game several with very huge Star Trek nerds, and it was fun. Uh, but let's go Wait, back before, to before. Hang on, I got to interject because Zach is in preparation for playing Star Wars or Star Trek. Has watched every single Star Trek episode. I haven't even done that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of my prep was I, I started watching Star Trek episodes a lot. Because you can't mess that stuff up. Um, yeah. So I wanted to go back to Mr. Smith's question before we get too far off. Um, and he said, how does prep differ from a pre-generated, no, pre-generated world versus a custom world? We've covered that. How does, yeah. pre, how does prep differ between role players versus mechanics players and their preferences? Scott? Hmm. Well, I mean, we talked a little bit about the kind of prep you need to do to, well, there's prep, right, to make like interesting encounters, right, to say, to not just be like, all right, you're fighting, this is a, an anti-goblin campaign, so it's all going to be against goblins, so it's goblins all the way, and they're going to get steadily harder or something. Maybe if you make the goblins led by an interesting charismatic leader, and these are each of his quirky little lieutenants, who all have their own little agenda. Maybe the RPers would be fine with that, and maybe the mechanics person would be like, oh, goblins again? Like, I have all this, like, fire resistance. I want to fight something that will shoot fire. So maybe there's something for that if you if you have players who are, like, really interested in certain aspects of the game, of which, you know, I shouldn't limit mechanics to combat. There's lots of different kinds of mechanics out there. Um, but are really interested in certain mechanics of the game uh, to tailor, like, challenges or things to address that. And, you know, RP is not just this big... Um, this big monolith, it can be like, oh, I'm really interested in doing like a romance type thing with this character with like this other NPC or, uh, you know, I, I want to fight for like prestige in the courts or something like that. Is to just like put in little challenges for that. I mean, I think it's the same thing. Like if you have characters interested in different things, which characters will be, right? They're all going to be different. Um, to just sort of listen to that and then put that stuff in. Now, maybe there is a big distinction between role play prep and that you can role play prep stuff that's system agnostic, but for mechanics prep, you got to be within the system. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I think that um, a lot of players would be irritated by my low prep approach if they are players that like to, that really get into the mechanics of a game because I do not really get into the mechanics of a game very much at all. I play games yeah. that have simple mechanics. If I was going to be running a Pathfinder game with, path, with experienced Pathfinder players, let's say the specific group in Santa Rosa that I used to play with, like... I think it would I think it would really pee them off that I did not have my head around that not just having a head around mechanics but that I wasn't creating a, encounters that were properly scaled that gave them the right amount of challenge that provided enough treasure like I think if you're going to be running with players who are very uh very interested in system mechanics I think you have to do a lot of what I would call mathematical prep for that Yeah I would I would beat you with a baseball bat I think <laughs> <laughs> just generally or yeah if, if you ran a pathfinder game and didn't prep i would i would beat you with a, that's with rough a, with a baseball bat right, no, well, no threats we don't want to have threats on the podcast <laughs> especially this, against this, the producer. if you know the system really well and maybe you have a stack of monster cards or something maybe you could throw something together to say oh we want some of these all right you know here's some trolls and some goblins or whatever like maybe you could build it on the flyer maybe you have pre-built encounters or something yeah, yeah, they I, have I, books of those too that you can use. Although, even running like for fourth edition, if you get the book Dungeon Delve, it's like one encounter for every level. But you gotta read that encounter and really get your head around it, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, true. I guess that is a form of prep, but it's not or, like this encounter will happen at this point. You know, it's just like here's a bunch that I could throw in. All right, I'll take this one. And yeah. you have to modify them. But I think, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Like if you're playing in a mechanics-heavy game. Um, it almost forces you to do prep because you have to design the encounters. You have to scale them correctly, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, you have to be really well-versed with the system to be able to improv combat. What about... Uh, yeah, go on. No, no, no sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. I will, um, you about Scott, say? you prepped Conan, which uh, is a pretty heavy game. Um, so what was it like? How much prep did you have to do? And are you happy with that? Or would you not want to do it? Interesting. Um, so I did two kind of different things. One was I had a pre-generated adventure, which I, of course, went through and tore apart and rearranged in a way that I liked it. Um, and then I sort of wrote my own adventure based off of some stuff in the books. I didn't make my own monsters or anything, but I, I did like essentially build an adventure uh, from a, a general idea that was in one of the stories. 
So one of the things that I figured out early on was to have, like I said, sort of like encounters set up. Conan, I think, cares less about like CR type things or like you need this many monsters at this much level. It's just kind of like, here's some big tough monsters and here's some little monsters. Actually, monsters don't even have levels, so it's not something you really need to worry about. Um, so I just had some of those in my back pocket. Some of those we never even got to, but I was like, um, you know, here's the stuff they can encounter. And I would improv at times when I would insert those. Like with the, uh, for example, in the, the Pact of Zabalba, you guys find yourself on a mysterious island and find yourself confronted with these strange soldiers wearing like bronze armor and some of these like, like painted up barbarian types. I didn't fully prepare when and how you would encounter each of those, but I definitely had those stats prepared. Like it would not be good if I had to flip through the book and find something or just like make it up be like, oh yeah, they'd have, I guess this many hit points or whatever, this much stress. Um, the other thing is I wrote, uh, I wrote an adventure and using it, it, monsters from the book and that too, I had to, I switched around the orders of things. Like there's a part, you know, you go to a different island and there's like a, this suspicious ship trolling around that's kind of divorced from the adventure, but it's something that involves you guys. And I didn't know when that would come up. Um, I thought maybe it'd come up in sort of the beginning, but you guys actually went through the entire adventure. And then as you were leaving, I was like, all right, here's a good point. And I threw it at you. So I had all the pieces prepared because you really need to do that for a crunchy game, unless you're really good. And I was definitely not really good. Um, but I was able to like rearrange when they come into play in order to fit the player's needs and the needs of the story. Not only that, with Conan, you have to make sure the adventures are properly balanced so that they don't become boring because we were so powerful at melee, two of the characters, that mm -hmm. unless you gave us something pretty tough, we were just going to freaking slay. And then we did. We waded mm -hmm. through the, the minions, but I mean, like, and that was fun. But if you had done it one more time, if we had one more easy battle, we would have gotten bored. Yeah. <laughs> There's this only so many ways that you can describe killing somebody with a halberd. Yeah, uh, this is particularly Pact of Zabalba, which which that session has a lot of like, yeah, you you encounter minions here, then minions here, and then different minions here, and then at the end it's like, all right, now here's like a big two big impossible bosses, um, so that ramps up pretty quick. But yeah, I, I agree that the it's it's cool in Conan because it's Conan doesn't a lot of his fights are pretty one sided, right, uh, in his favor, um, but occasionally he'll run up against something that's really tough. But it's it's fine in that genre. Yeah. To you guys to just stomp everything. It's those pecs, man. It's those yeah. pecs. It's the his power mighty of... fuse. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, and, it, and it worked really well. It was very well balanced because we slayed everybody, and then we were like, okay, these monsters aren't going to be much trouble. And then we're like, oh, my God, I just almost died. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like Conan because you show him being a badass, and then there's a monster, and he's like, ah, I'm under threat, you know? And it kind of like, yeah. it, that really worked. And I think that that's, but I mean, again, so that was a high prop. Mitchell. Yeah, so uh, uh, Mr. Smith brings up a good point that longstanding systems, uh, you which are usually pretty uh, fairly uh, complicated, like he mentions D and D, Pathfinder, Champions, Rifts, etc. Um, there is a certain expectation to a consistency with the mechanics that if you deviate as a GM um, without first explaining it to the players, you're going to have issues. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really good point in terms of prep. If you're running a D and D or Pathfinder champions, whatever game, these games that have been around for a while and are pretty mechanically heavy, you as a GM need to do the prep to understand the system so that when a player wants to do something, there is consistency and understanding of what, uh, is expected. And again, you uh, have to, you have to use balance. You have to, you have to, you have to actually write your encounters out ahead of time. You can't, like, if you're playing Robotech, which is the same system as Rifts, is real, unless you're really darn good at that system, that you can do it on the fly, man. You really need to plan your encounters ahead of time so that, you, that your player characters don't get annihilated by using that very crunchy combat system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Emmy Angel, uh, Hi, just Emmy. above. Uh, Welcome yeah, hello. to the podcast, Dan. It's so cool to have people watching on the second cast. I like it. I know, right? They're all just bots made by me, so enjoy that. Uh, as <laughs> that's why he's not longer. talking as much, because he's just yeah, impersonating I'm like, people. No, I'm managing all my different computers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, this individual mentions that they were in uh, combat challenges that were incredibly easy, uh, and it became frustrating uh, for the person because, you know, you, you come to game, uh, especially in Pathfinder, wanting to be cool, 
you know, you, you spend so much time making a, a character and you anticipate your character doing cool things and going off on an adventure. Uh, but when you as a GM keep throwing these kind of like really easy mechanics and combat, the combat becomes just a chore instead of a adventure. Oh my God. That's um, such a great point, dude. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So no, that, I mean, that that's it. it I think it's a great point that Emmy angel brought up uh, yeah. and Mr. Smith, I will forward you the paycheck um, as soon as possible. <laughs> 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 this, I mean, this goes back to the truism of know your players, right? Um, yeah. I, I had a character in a, a star Wars D 20 game from years ago. And, I was like, I want this character to get like the crap beaten out of him all the time. Like, I want that to be his thing. Um, and so it was really great when fights would just be super narrow and I'd end the fight barely having one with one hit point. I was like, yes, this is exactly what I want. Just covered mm -hmm. in blood, barely alive, perfect. There was another player in that game who, uh, maybe not so much in that one, but in later games, didn't really like that sort of thing and didn't... Uh, he was more sort of like an RP type of person um, who was more into story and less into uh, the kind of cutthroat, cutthroat battles types of things. So he would he would like things that were more easy combats because he was, I don't want to say like threatened, but like he, he didn't like the idea of his character dying or, or being told that like the, yeah. the, the GM was doing this and now you have a horrible scar or something like they weren't into that. So maybe they would have liked the, the easier encounters as long as they weren't super tedious. Uh, maybe there's some other things going on there, but yeah, I mean, I I saw that a lot in Vampire LARP because you generally spend about six months making a character. You're making ties. You're building a like six page history for your character, uh, and so the idea of character death, like some people are like, I don't want to do combat at all. Don't bring it towards me. Don't bring it in my vicinity. I worked a lot of time. I spent money on this costume, so you know, don't don't throw anything difficult at me. Um, but you know, that, that all just goes back into, to knowing, knowing the player. Um, and you really just got to adapt on the fly as a GM. Yeah. Bring it back to prep though. Got to, everything has to come back to prep. Yeah. Um, you know, prep, brush your teeth, read your rule book. <laughs> How do you prep knowing your players? Oh man. Uh, so I still, some... I'm still going to be on the side of no prep cause I'm going to run the games and I'm going to run. Yeah. Them, yes. I, I think talking to your players individually is an important part of uh, making a great campaign. Um, figuring out what type of role player or gamer they are, really. Are, are you a person who, are you really good at mechanics? Am I going to anticipate that whatever you build is going to be able to have a lot of narrative control? Um, are you a role player? Uh, are you a thespian? Do you enjoy that aspect and just kind of like chill out when combat comes um knowing that and then prepping so that you make sure your session gives each person um a spotlight it is very important to the enjoyment of the whole group okay now we're into a new topic which is microscoping and i want to because this is in session prep right and i want to mm. i want to run the sting again because i like it and because it works um so we're gonna do that, and then I'll introduce the next segment. All right. Well, did we did we want to hit up the last? Over, dude, you're talking over the screen. <laughs> ah, we almost had a perfect sting. All right. So, talking about prep, moving on from pregame prep, which I think is what Scott was referring to, basically reading, writing, things like that, into in session prep. Um, Mitchell, why don't you do you want to just uh, say what you do as in session prep? I think you might steal our thunder, but. We have a, me and Scott have a very specific thing that we do. Like, well, what do you mean by in session prep? All right, cool. I will tell you then. So, <laughs> Scott, do you want to do you want to describe what we do at yes. the beginning of a? And uh, usually we so do this at the, at the first session after people have made their player characters. So there's a tabletop game called Microscope, which is kind of unlike other tabletop games. It's, it's a game where you build a history, um, and it's all there's no GM, uh, and it's just a collaborative storytelling game. So you, there's a lot of elements to it, but you sort of like. Um, ask people at the start, what do you want to be in this game? Like, and usually the kind of default thing is science fiction because that's kind of it captures all these best. But you can do it with absolutely anything for sure. And it's like, okay, I want the, I want this to be a sci-fi game, but there's no aliens; it's all humans. And someone's like, okay, I want there to be big open space battles. And somebody else says, okay, I want there to be like really weird physics things, like an interstellar with like time differentials or whatever. And you just like kind of make a list of rules, almost like a, a sort of setting bible, which is a term that writers use. 
uh, that sort of narrow down what you want the game to be like. And then you just, as a group, just like add events to this timeline to see what happens in this world. And so it could be like, okay, it starts in like a dark age when humans have lost all the technology and it's going to end when they regain it all and retake the stars. And you're like, okay, well, there's going to be a big war right here. And then you can zoom in and add details to that. And you can zoom in down to the level of like scenes where you're like this commander with this person and you can like role play out a scene. Um, but can I, can I you, stop you like, for a sec? Yeah. Um, let's, I want to give people an actual example of it. So all right. uh, can you throw a setting at me, Mitch or um, Scott? All right. Uh, Western with alien technology. Hello Kitty. Okay, so we're talking about um, those two. I, I'm gonna have a hard time. My brain's gonna blow up if I try to put those two together. All right, let's just do. Um, I can do no. I can do cowboys and aliens, or I can do Hello Kitty, but I can't do Hello Kitty cowboys and aliens. How about the aliens or cat people? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna do cowboy and aliens. So <laughs> it's the year is 1887, and like the setting is uh, the head of a the head of a, of the whatever it is when they build the railroads where the railhead wherever that is. And they're building the rest of it, right? And you guys are all people that are involved some way. You've rolled up characters, and your characters are all people that are involved some way in building the railroads. Think that show, Hell on Wheels. So one of you is uh, a former slave. One of you is a former Confederate soldier. One of you is a, uh, a laborer from China who's working on the thing. One of you is the security guy from the, uh, from the railway company. I just stole all those characters from uh, the show. Uh, so those, that's the set of characters, and that's the setting. And... Um, you know, it's going to start off, and then we know that there's going to be aliens, right, somehow involved. So what I would say is, Mitchell, this is the, that's the setting. Um, w tell me one thing that you want there to be in this game. Uh, I want there to be character drama. Okay, you want interpersonal conflict. Scott, mm -hmm. what is something you want to see in this in this game? I campaign? want the aliens to be really mysterious and inhuman. I don't want like the dudes in suits kind of aliens. I want the like like amorphous slugs that are like a mile wide type of aliens. Okay, so you've already answered my second question in the microscope pregame, which is tell me something you don't want. Um, but since it was combined with your, with your what you do want, I'm gonna cross it off. But we'll still use it. Mitchell, what's something you don't want to see in this Cowboys and Aliens game? Ooh, I uh, do not want a PVE-centric game. What is PVE? Player versus environment. Uh, what does that mean? So I want the central idea of the game to be my conflicts with other players. Okay, but that's just something you want. So, mm. oh, so I, That's like right. a tone of the game, both, right? Both, of, both yeah. of you guys did the same thing. You both made the thing you don't <laughs> want the opposite of what you do want. Give me another yeah. separate, totally separate thing that you don't want to be in the game. <laughs> I don't want horses. No horses. <laughs> All right. You know what? And as a GM, I'm going to roll with that. So that's interesting. So a plague probably has come along and has killed all the horses in this area. And you can't, but maybe, maybe people like maybe an Indian tribe that's nearby, maybe they still have horses, but basically like you don't have any horses. So like that seriously, the only, you don't have no transportation. The only transportation is foot. You have supplies. You have uh, you know, Food and things like that that's going to rot if it doesn't get to the people. The people might starve. There are no coaches. There's no Pony Express. Like, society has broken down, and maybe it has something to do with the aliens. Scott, what is something you don't want to be in this game? I don't want humans to be... Hmm. How do I say this? I, I want alien tech to be... That's a want. <laughs> what don't you want? <laughs> I don't want alien tech to be easy to use. Ah. I don't want it to be a blaster that you pick up and shoot. I want it to be something really weird and difficult to get your head around. Okay, you literally have to get your head around it because in order to use it, it has to be implanted in your head and human doctors of the time are going to have like a really hard time doing it, but it will be possible. But you can't pick mm -hmm. up the alien blaster and turn it on them, so that's great. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. We have two yeah. things. And then the next thing I would do after that is, okay... What is, Mitchell, what is something you want in this particular game session to happen in this particular game session? I want to fall in love with Scott's character. I love it. All right. Terrific. That's fantastic. Um, I, I, I'm now going to, I put that in my notes and it's going to happen. Scott, what is something you want to have in the first session to happen? Um, I want to find a reason to run away from my home. <gasps> Probably. Maybe it's because you fell in love with, uh, with this escaped slave. Ooh. Yeah. So All there right. we go. And that's how you microscope. And it's great because we've had players that 
have ended a session and they kind of come to me as a GM or whatever and they're like, I didn't really like this, I didn't really like that, or this isn't kind of the game that I want to play. I've, I've quit games, you know, very recently because they weren't what I wanted and they weren't where I wanted to go. Um, when you do microscope before each game session, before the campaign and before the game sessions, even if what I ask for doesn't happen, I got to say it. And so I, I have the faith that it will happen or that maybe you couldn't make it happen, but at least I know I have a, vo and a, a, a vote and a voice in how the game's going. So this is and so this is a kind of prep and like it's it's what we did with Star Wars and allowed me to run a zero prep game of Star Wars. Yeah, and and as a GM, you know, when people list out those uh those things that you want and don't want, you know, I write that stuff down and at the beginning of every session I come back to it. Like these are the principles that are the core of this game. If you're running like if you're running a one shot, don't worry about it, of course, but if it's a campaign, you know, you have sort of the DNA of this thing from your players. Like this is what they want out of this game. And it could be more or less directed like we did it here, but mm -hmm. I would always try to come back to it and always be sure, like, this is this is lesson number one. Always try to work this stuff in. Because players literally told you what they want. It makes it really easy to give it to them. Yeah. Just got to make sure you do it. Yeah, that's the hard part is doing it. I don't feel like it's that hard because what it does is it lifts this tremendous weight off of the GM shoulders of, like, you've got a weight because you don't know, you know, you want to give the players what they want, or you have a weight because there's a story that you read and you're like, ah, oh, maybe they're going off the rails on that story. You know, it, mm -hmm. it really frees you up to, uh, to do the kind of um, improvisation that is going to be, that's going to take the game places where ne nobody ever could imagine it goes. And you know, your game session is doing well when that kind of thing happens, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith brings up the idea of the rule of three. Uh, each player would have three friends, three enemies, and three places or things of importance. Yeah, this is the same sort of thing. It's just giving, it's all about just giving the players a piece of the story that they can just make up and do with as they please. Whether it's just a sentence to say, what is the tone of this game? It's this, what's something you want? Or it's like, make a detailed NPC and your ties to it, or detail a place in the setting. Another thing we did in uh, the Apocalypse World game I ran, this is a trick that I learned. I think it was on the Apocalypse World forums. I don't know where it is. But you just, you establish where the players live and you just draw it in the center of a blank piece of paper. And then you say, you know, pass it around the table and say, add something to the map. You could say like, you know, you're, uh, you're Spig Head, the gun lugger, and nobody can mess with you, but where's somewhere that even you're afraid to go to? Or, you know, you're a driver, you go around a lot. Like you probably have a stash, like where do you keep it and why do you think that's safe? And just have them add stuff to the map. And now you get this world map that everybody's contributed to and everybody has stuff they want to go investigate in. This is a tremendous application of this kind of microscoping. And I want to actually tell people what the examples were that we came up with. So we had our little town oh. in post-apocalyptic Southern Florida. It was all flooded. Yeah, it was all, it had been flooded by the apocalypse, right? And then so like some like of the locations Florida. we came up with, we came up with a magical island full of horses because my oh, guy was kind of horse. They're ro robot horses. Robot right. horses. My guy was like a gunslinger. He had watched a bunch of old West movies or whatever. It's read books. And so he found himself some guns and he built himself a cowboy hat. And he like, he's like, there, I need to get me a horse. So there was a, there was an island with the robot horses. Then there was, uh, the sent like the, uh, headquarters for this gang that was going to be one of the antagonists. And the idea we came up with is, you know, when you're driving along in the sticks on some highway and you see like a big sign that says like adult war, adult bookstore world, and it's huge. And it's like over 50,000 square feet. Like I've never been to one of those places. And I always like have this image in my head. This is just enormous like store selling these adult products. Super weird. So we're like, that's the headquarters of the gang. They like found like one of those and that's where they live. And we're like, oh yeah, all right. So the clothes that they wear are like the bondage clothes that they found in the place. So all these people are dressed in like leather straps with like metal like rings on them and stuff like that. And they're all basically wearing all this bondage gear. And it was like, oh my God, that's why the, they look like the people in Mad Max, you know? Yeah, and they don't really understand why. Because <laughs> they thought, well, like, this, oh, must this is what the people of the time must have worn, right? <laughs> oh, these are relics of the ancient age. Exactly. And it was so great because once we had created, and then we created a few other things, which I don't remember. Scott, if you do, feel free to chime in. But we had created this world together. Then we were so excited to go out and like party with it. You know what I mean? And it was mm -hmm. like, that's why I think that microscoping, and this is the great thing about microscoping. You can use it to ask the players what they want. You can use it to design a campaign, to design a session, to design a location. And we even used it to design the enemy. So like, what's the enemy like? And his name was like, Scott was like, what's his name? And somebody said, Dust Witch. 
So like, great, his name is Dust Witch, which is a really weird name. And it makes you think like, well, why is he called Dust Witch? Is he a witch that like manipulates dust? Is he really covered in dust? Like, I don't know. Like that, that guy was like a total freaking mystery. So that was great. You can yeah, use- Yeah, somebody else was like, he looks like Mr. Clean. <laughs> yeah, he looks like Mr. Totally Clean. and wears white. Yeah, he wears white, but somehow he's the Dust Witch too. So I mean, <laughs> Scott would actually rely on this in game a lot of times. You'd be like, okay, so you guys come to a place like, uh, and there's a leader there like, okay, tell me, tell me about this guy. And he'd be very specific with it too. Like, what's his affectation? Like, what's, what, what, what's weird about this guy? Yeah, and a cool thing is to tie it to your character too and make it be sort of in character to be like, oh, you know, Ringo, you've been around these places before. You've run into him before. Like, uh, you know, like, why don't you trust him or something like that? That's not uh, a good example because it's a little bit proscriptive on his part, but yeah. to sort of like, to sort of play up that like, your character would know about this, so you tell me what the answer is. So Emmy Angel uh, brings up a good question. Uh, what if people want things or ban things that uh, dramatically alter the sort of game that you want to run to the point that you don't really want to run it? Have you guys had this happen? No. Uh, I've been a part of a game where it has caused some issues. So let's say, um, uh, well, I mean, I've ran, I've ran a 5e game um, and I didn't do the microscope at the beginning, but halfway through, I just wanted feedback. Uh, and one of the feedback was, Hey, Mitchell, this game, I feel like there's like, there's no hope, you know, it's very, it's a very oppressive setting. Yes. And I was like, Oh man, uh, that's like exactly the game I was hoping to run. Yeah. And, and like, like that's, that's the game. Um, so I, I think in the end, the, the, the player like wasn't there at the cool. final battle. Um, but you know, it, it's, is definitely there where uh, a purse, a GM and other people kind of have an expectation for a game. Maybe if majority of players want horror and there's a one player who's like, I don't, I don't want that at all. Uh, or there's, then, why are you playing a horror game? You, you've signed up to play a horror game though. Yeah. But part of the microscope thing is, I mean, what do you do when someone says that? Do you say, okay, thank you player for coming. I'll see you the next campaign I run. I've never seen that happen. I mean, one thing you could say is, well, we can have aspects of both or your player, you know, we're always fans of splitting the party, by the way, your player might mm -hmm. not be involved in those scenes. Um, but I have not had that kind of dramatic thing happen in all the games I've microscoped. Scott, what yeah. do you think from your psychological point of view, uh, <laughs> to what Mitchell is saying about that and what Emmy Angel 789 said? Yeah, this is, this is a tough thing. I mean, the kind of the, the easy throwaway answer is like, talk to your players ahead of time, set expectations, that's but that's not really doing. the question. It's yeah, but like, let's say that you didn't do that or you didn't do that enough and there was some miscommunication or something. And now you're like, you're really excited to play this game and you realize that your players want something different. I mean, there's not, I think there's not going to be a hard and fast answer to say, oh, you should absolutely do this. I think the answer is just like negotiate, you know? Just say, like, well, this is what I'm interested in. Like, I hear you that you don't want it. Like, let's find something that we're both into because it's important that everybody be oh. on board and want to contribute. Um, how you do that is going to depend on you and your players and your relationship to each other. Uh, but, you know, just like bring it up as a friendly collaborative discussion and say like, oh, you know, I was kind of interested in this. Is that something you guys want? And well, as a GM, I tend to want, like, I, I see the players as the main characters in the story. And so I usually, to the best of my ability, defer to them for things. Unless there's something where I'm like, you know, the core of the game is this. If the players really want something that I didn't anticipate or didn't plan for, I'll try to make it work. Because that just I think happened it... to you too. That just happened to you on RuneQuest. You wanted to have everybody be in the same family. Yeah. The players didn't want <laughs> yeah. to do it. And so you changed. Like, and I think you bring up a good point. I mean, these people are people who are getting together to play a game together. Uh, you know, I don't think people, if somebody's being a jerk about it and being really um, inflexible, then you've got a problem. Uh, and you should, maybe that's not the right group to be playing with, and you should think about who's going to be playing. But I think the answer is like, and I think another thing you can do, if you have things that are diametrically opposite, you can just say, all right, well, why don't we just reset, go around again, and you know, if you know that Mitchell has uh, is terrified to be in a horror game, then you know, obviously, let's 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 workshop this again, folks. And I think that's a perfectly rational and good way to do it. But I mean, generally right. speaking, when I've seen it. It hasn't come up with it. And like, if it's something diametrically opposed to what I want to do, like, let's say uh, the whole point of my game is that you should be able to pick up the blasters and use them on the aliens. Like, all right, well, then you're in a position where you have to think what's more important, me or what the players want. And the answer is always generally what the players want. Um, still in all, I don't, I find that maybe surprisingly to some, 
uh, it's the kind of thing you can imagine happening in your head, but when you actually start doing it with people, you don't, I, I don't feel that those conflicts are something that are uh, a particularly huge concern. Uh, I mean, there's I, ways I've to deal it. with it, you know. Yeah, I've seen it happen, and I would. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I know we don't have much time left, Seven but I think a, a topic to discuss maybe on a future one is uh, do the players' needs come above the GMs? And I would state that they do not. I think they're an equal partner. Um, Interesting. But, you know, that is, that is something. Well, Mitchell, uh, then I could say, time. listen, the entire point, one of the big points of the game is that you should be able to use blasters. Um, speaking human to human, like, it's kind of something I want to have in. Do you have another thing maybe that you don't want, you know? And like I said, I think if you come up with something that could be a conflict while using microscope, talk it out. Uh, you know, yeah. people are going to be. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be like if I was in your microscope and I'm like, uh, Josh, I want you to prep. I want you to do a lot of prep. I want to be able to ask you a question about this setting and I want you to know it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't want you to wing the rules ever. Uh, I want consistency in my game. I want to be able to trust that what you say is actually the, the rule set. I will um, refer you to Mitchell, who has read the book <laughs> twice, and he will run a game on Saturday. <laughs> I don't want to run this game. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, I mean, I think that comes uh, that that comes with a good point. Is that play the game you want to, and even if the the game is looking like it's going to a, in a to a direction that you don't want, don't take it personally if someone leaves or wants to do another game or will wait for the next session. Yeah, uh, this, this is really just all for fun. And, you know, it's, it's no hard feelings if what you want is different than what I want. Yeah, ME 789 just put it perfectly. Not all players are for all GMs and not the other way around. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. whole point of Microscope is not to add an additional level of rules that we have to abide by. <laughs> the whole point of it is it's a facilitator to help us have a conversation and set expectations before the game. Uh, before we run out of time, I just want to uh, go through some housekeeping stuff. Um, one thing... We have a Facebook group, which is facebook.com Tanker Talk. We have a Facebook page. So if you look up Tanker Talk on Facebook, we're the only ones there. So <laughs> it shouldn't be difficult to find. I got to get quicker on the switching. Um, and also, we have a Twitter address. It's at Tanker Talk, relatively self explanatory. Um, yeah. Yeah. So does anybody have any closing thoughts? Because we're coming to the end of our time. I think this was uh, all good stuff. We, we've. Talked a lot about uh, different sorts of things you could do with this. All right. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate uh, those in the uh, conversation adding and telling us your own experiences. Um, it's uh, well, the best part about table topping is uh, learning from other people. So it's always appreciated. And uh, from me, that's it. You guys want to say goodbye? And this is Scott saying goodbye. And Mitchell, say your catchphrase. Oh. Uh, he forgot it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's and, just the way the cookie crumbles. Okay, yeah, Mitchell's going to have a different catchphrase every time. So <laughs> all right, bye, y'all. Bye.